presentation in two main parts. The first part would be going through the general overview and then the uh, structural analysis, different type of analysis that we, ha we are doing for the uh, bridges. Talking about the time history analysis, different type of time history analysis that we need or, you know, it's uh, well known and it's being used for structural analysis, especially for bridges. Then talking about the displacement time history, the requirements for displacement time history, why we are doing that and how we have to handle that. Then talking about the, the next part, uh, we'll be talking about that if we are doing the displacement time history analysis. Uh, what, the, what are the considerations that we have to keep in mind and satisfy for uh, running a correct analysis because when it comes to the um, nonlinear type of time history analysis, uh, you most probably need a strong software that can help you with the modeling and setting up all those nonlinearities and uh, different type of forcing functions that you need. So we're going to go through those details and talking about the substructure and also the soil, stru uh, soil structure interaction uh, option and also how to generate the forcing functions for such analysis. To start with, I'm going to just give you a quick overview about the structure analysis. So when we're talking about the structure analysis or bridge analysis, uh, we are talking about uh, mainly four groups, uh, static and dynamic, and each of them could be linear or nonlinear. We're talking about the static linear analysis would be like a very simple uh, type of loading, let's say like a self-weight loading that you have on your structure or all the gravity loads. Uh, you're going to see what's the res uh, response of the structure to that, and that will be a basic uh, static linear. That's pretty common for most of the bridges and, uh, you know, that satisfies the needs for some of the bridges in different regions. But that, not, mm, that might not be the end of the story. For several bridges, we need to go into the dynamic analysis uh, to see how the structure or the bridge going to respond to a uh, dynamic uh, or seismic event. So for that purpose, we have uh, two main analysis, uh, the, I mean, dynamic analysis type response spectrum and time history, which the response spectrum uh, is a linear uh, dynamic analysis, meaning the linear, linear means here that uh, material remains linear and then the source structure interaction, we're going to consider them all as the linear. Uh, this type of response spectrum analysis uh, is satisfying for most of the bridges, which even they are located in the highly seismic um, zones depends on the uh, size of the bridge, on the uh, you know number of spans that you have, and then the different the side. Uh, all those are different parameters, but most of the uh, DOTs or you know uh, organizations just require you to do the response spectrum to find out the uh, you know demand or dynamic demands on the structure. On the other hand, we have the uh, time history analysis, which the time history uh, analysis we consider as a nonlinear. Um, type of analysis because we are considering the nonlinearity of the material. For example, um, you know when you have your pier or you have your pile or even your um, you know the girders. Not only we consider their um, you know uh, we take care of those uh, linear or you know el um, elastic behavior of the structure. We are also going to see the nonlinearity on this structure, or seeing like a more capacity of the a bridge when it goes to the plastic zone. So in this way, we are just utilizing more of the cap capacity of the software. So we're going to talk about those details uh, later in this presentation. So these two types that I mentioned about the, the dynamic analysis, response spectrum, and time history, those are uh, run to run the structure to find out the uh, demand on the structure. So by demand, I mean what will be the um, total uh, displacements, like uh, deformations, all the uh, internal forces, what will be the response of a structure to that type of loading. On the other hand, we have the static nonlinear analysis or pushover analysis where we are um, uh, running this type of analysis to find out the capacity of the structure. So I have the bridge, I want to know what's the capacity of my bridge. So one way to find out that, um, uh, that capacity is to just push the structure until it fails. 
Another failure we consider it by the you know defining the plastic hinges, which later on we're gonna see them in the detail. So here I got just uh, want to show you the general overview of the structure analysis and what we are doing for the building and bridges. But today we're gonna just focus on the bridges. Now let's talk about just focus on the uh, time history analysis and see what type of time history analysis we can run. So um, here I just uh, show you three um, simple types which is well, um, mostly used for the structures. The first one would be, for example, the machinery vibration or if you have, if you want to consider the, uh, for example, vibration of a, uh, a train on, the, on your bridge. So that would be uh, kind of like, you know, um, this type of, for example, sinusoidal uh, type of forces you can apply on the structure or it could be different examples. We are not going to discuss about this today. I'm going to just show you uh, like different types. Another one would be, uh, for example, applying the normalized acceleration of the ground uh, based on the specific, specific um, earthquake. For example, uh, you know, the San Francisco earthquake. So you're going to see what happens, uh, I mean, what this function, uh, forcing function is going to do to my structure. So it depends on the, where you are constructing the uh, bridge. So you may use different type of, um, um, you know, normalized acceleration functions. And also, we can define the, that forcing function could be a uh, displacement. So it's going to be the displacement of the ground um, uh, during a uh, seismic event. So you're going to see what's happening. And then we're going to discuss about this, that how we can generate such a displacement, a displacement time history. I mean. So um, I, as we discussed today, we're going to talk about the displacement time history analysis of the long bridges. Let's see uh, what's the time uh, displacement time history and where do we need to use those guys, okay? So displacement time history uh, is the history of the ground displacement during an earthquake event. So that's pretty uh, simple definition. So it meaning that when you have earthquake in center location, what will be the, uh, you know, displacement of the different part of the ground uh, responding to that force. And then we can use that function to run the um, you know, um, apply the force on the, for example, the new bridge that I'm going to uh, generate right now. When do we need to use this type of displacement time history analysis? So displacement time history analysis, you normally not gonna use them for the uh, regular uh, bridges or like a conventional or highway bridges, uh, but it mostly used when you have a long bridge or something similar to this bridge that you see here when we have like a deep, deep piles. So when you have a deep pile, what happens is that the different layers of this, uh, the pile or you know, are covered by different type of soil. For example, um, in the top layers we have the clay, then we have the sand, then we have the rock. So definitely, definitely the uh, behavior of the soil structure interaction would be different in different layers. So uh, in such a such a uh, situation, we need to run the, the displacement time history analysis, and not only the uh, soil structure interaction would be different, but also when the earthquakes come to the uh, different, I mean, experiencing different layers, those waves are definitely gonna generate different type of forcing. So we're gonna talk about them, that how those are um, generated, but in this slide, you're gonna see that what's the need of this uh, displacement time history. So this is one technique that we're normally using it for long spans or when you have like a deep piles where the uh, different layers of soil exist in that location. So let's see what happens during an earthquake. So when an er earthquake happens, so different ground motion uh, you're gonna see. So uh, we see that in a different location of the ground, let's say this is, uh, let's say 4,000 4, feet and then, so definitely, we're gonna see different uh, ground motion experiencing there, and that ground motion will be, um, you know, transferred to the location of the piles or the, um, you know, your columns. Depends how the foundation is set up, and then those guys experiencing different forcing functions. All right, and then the next part would be that those guys, those uh, forces, gonna shake the structure, and after the uh, structure is shaken. Now, what happens 
is that the structure gives give us a response. So that response it means uh, the displacement, the, the formation of different parts. It could be a internal forces like a moment, shear, actual forces. So those are all considered as a response of the structure based on the, um, you know, the earthquake force that we applied on them. And uh, once again, different part of the ground or different part of the uh, bridge uh, experiencing different forces. Okay. So uh, let's um, just uh, summarize it and uh, showing you the steps for the seismic design of the uh, long span bridge. So for the seismic design, as I said, we need two two parts. One will be the um, checking the capacity uh, capacity of the structure. One is to see what's the demand on the structure. Once again, time, displacement time history is uh, run to find the demand on the structure. So what we do, what an engineer does is that we, got, we apply the ground motion to the foundation, which causes the, you know, shaking the structure. And uh, as we discussed, different uh, displacement time history functions uh, would be applied to the different location of the ground. Uh, once again, this might be a different location of the, you know, different piles, or it could be also a different location in the depth of the pile also. So for example, in the, uh, this slide, we may have different forcing function here and different forcing function right in the middle of this pile. Depends how deep is that and how many layers of the soil um, you have there. Then we have to consider the nonlinear material and boundary conditions. So the material itself, like a, um, the columns or the pile, they uh, show the nonlinear behavior as well as the soil structure interaction. Um, has the nonlinear uh, behavior as well. So the way that you're pushing the soil in the dynamic event, how that's going to respond. So this will be the details that are going to come up. The next step would be getting the response of the structure, like a bending moment, shear forces, displacement, reactions. So all those that the uh, engineer need to get to the, do the design. Based on those uh, responses as we discussed, the, a bridge engineer need to just uh, do the design, design the different uh, elements of the structure, like a superstructure, like a uh, substructure, foundations, like a bearings. So now we're going to discuss about a uh, different part of the, um, uh, the bridge or different components, how we have to take care of those guys. Once again, when it comes to the like displacement time history, and you have a large structure, and you're seeing the nonlinearity in those elements, and uh, you know nonlinearity in soil and structure, so there's like it become mm, kind of complicated analysis. And uh, doing the hand calculation, I can't say it's impossible or it's gonna be impossible in the short time. So you need to spend um, a very long time to do it with the hand calculation or simplified method. Uh, but so you definitely need to have a uh, sophisticated software, something like uh, one of our software, like the Civil, which you can easily handle this part for you. You can completely model the structure. You can consider the nonlinearity in the, um, you know, model the soil springs, nonlinear soil springs. You can model the nonlinear elements uh, of the material and also run the diff apply the different forcing function on different part of the structure. So that's kind of, um, you know, the kind of requirement to run different, uh, this displacement time history analysis. Now in this slide you see that uh, we have different forcing functions and we have the unique forcing function at different location of the foundations. We're going to define the nonlinearity for material and define the nonlinearity for soil structure interaction. All right. So what consideration we need to we need for the uh, displacement time history for a long bridge? I put it in the three parts. Uh, talking about the substructure, talking about the foundation itself, and um, finally we're going to talk about the forcing function. So these three uh, would be the main uh, important part of this presentation. For the substructure, I'm going to talk about the how to define the nonlinear property or nonlinear behavior of the bearings. 
which is a um, part of a um, bridge, and normally we are using them, especially when we have the, the seismic events. Then we're going to uh, talk about the column itself and the formation of the plastic hinges in those, and then uh, we're going to talk about the using the uh, plastic capacity of the columns, and then how to run the analysis, and how to generate or how to find out those uh, plastic behavior or plastic hinges. For the foundation, uh, we're going to uh, talk about the methods that are available to find out the uh, modeling the abutment or modeling the soil behind the abutment, because that's pretty important. And uh, if you just ignore those, um, you know, for example, soil springs, you're going to come up with a completely different uh, response of the structure, which might be not what you are looking for. All right? And also, uh, the, after that abutment, we're going to talk about the how to model the piles. Because uh, when we have the pile, piles are uh, surrounded by the soil. We have to simulate the soil springs and then uh, there are different methods. When you have like a large structure, what you have to do. When you have like a smaller structure, what you have to do. And then different methods for generating those, uh, you know, options. We're going to talk about the direct method and also the, uh, the substructure method. And finally, we're talking about the forcing function because uh, what happens in a in an event in an earthquake is that uh, mostly the um, accelerations and the velocities are recorded by the machines now um, by accelerograms. Now, if you want to run the displacement time history, what's the method to get those displacement functions? All right. So we're going to talk about two general methods and explaining that how those guys are going to help you to generate such a uh, you know forcing function. All right. So let's start with the substructure. Uh, today I'm not going to talk about the superstructure itself. Uh, but uh, once again, if you're using any uh, software like Midas Civil, uh, you can define nonlinearity to any part of the superstructure. But for these uh, seismic um, forces, most of the uh, substructure and foundation would be uh, more important to define those nonlinearity for them. And then most of the time, the uh, plastic hinges happening in the uh, column itself, and then you know there there is a possibility to have like a uh, collapse in the structure in the event in the superstructure, but that's a different story. We're not going to talk about them today. All right. So uh, one part is the bearings. So bearings we are normally using them um, to connect the superstructure to substructure. All right. So this connection um, has two components. If you look at these bearings, we have the one vertical. Um, you know, the when the superstructure is sitting on the uh, your columns. So that's a vertical uh, transferring the forces. Another one would be tra uh, transversely, which is in the this direction, x, I mean y and z direction. So what happens there? When you have the earthquake, these uh, bearings are going to show you the uh, nonlinear behavior. As you can see, for example, similar to such a curve, which you can see that it's not going linearly going, I mean, increasing the displacement by increasing the forces. The displacement is not increasing linearly, and as you can see, it is nonlinear. This is very good and very useful for us. Uh, we're going to talk about the advantage of using these bearings, um, but now we're going to just talk about the behavior for now. Well, uh, this bearing shows a kind of linear in the uh, regular static forces. For example, this uh, first part, you see that this is a kind of linear part. So that linear part, we're going to see them in when you have the moving load analysis, when you are doing the, for example, uh, regular gravity forces. Those would be the linear part. And these bearings are pretty important because you know, you're doing this type of analysis, like time history analysis, both for the new structures, when you are constructing a new structure, so you need to design, you have to ensure that that bridge is uh, good enough to handle all type of forces that it, it might experience. And also, uh, we're doing this time history analysis for existing bridges. So there are some existing bridges which may not have enough um, you know, uh, uh, capacity to be able to handle certain type of uh, you know, earthquake because they've, they've been constructed like uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, which you know, maybe there wasn't enough uh, information for the seismic design. Now we're going to 
uh, rehabilitate those, and therefore, uh, you know, you, you run the displacement time history, or, or in general, time history analysis. Now, I said that these bearings are important because, uh, personally, I saw there are many cases then uh, for the old bridges, or I mean existing bridges, that uh, they weren't able, to, they didn't have enough capacity for these seismic events, and then there were like a plans for the rehabilitating those. If you want to do the rehabilitation, if you want to uh, increase the sections or doing any type of those, that's one, one, one part because it's going to be so expensive. But I saw so many cases that just, um, you know, placing the bearings for the uh, different part of the structure, like uh, uh, in apartments or on, the, on top of the pier, and those can be pretty economical and then uh, it can save the structure a lot because when we see this, like this nonlinear behavior of these bearings. So what happens is that the energy will be dissipated um, uh, while you have the experience. So there, therefore, the forces, forces which are coming from the ground, uh, this will not be transferred. I mean, most of them will be dissipated, and then just a small part of that will be transferred to the superstructure. So we're going to have, uh, you know, the structure going to function uh, perfectly even during the uh, seismic events. So this is pretty important and it could be used for the existing bridges as well as for the new bridges. Another part of this substructure would be the column. So I have like a one uh, image here which, which shows you how the column may behave uh, under a seismic event. So definitely we're going to have the deformation. Normally um, probably we don't consider the plastic deformation of the structures or uh, sorry the, uh, the material like a concrete or even steel we don't consider those uh, for the regular analysis but when it comes to the seismic analysis if you want to just consider this I mean the elastic behavior of the structure you may need to sometimes you may need to um, have a very large um, you know, sections to respond to that much of force because the dynamic force you can just consider it as a static force which has like a magnifying factors as well on top of those. So the more, I mean, if you increase the size of this uh, sections, so what happens is that you're going to have more uh, uh, self weight there. You're going to have more masses there, and then that mass going to absorb more energy and kind of kind of like uh, contradicting each other. So you're just increasing the size and then the force will be more and it kind of it goes uh, on and on, definitely not going to be economical. So what we're going to do, we're going to consider or we're going to use the uh, plastic deformation of the structures uh, for the seismic design as well. Now how to understand what is the plastic deformation and when we are going to the plastic zone. One of the methods that we are um, handling this part is to define the plastic hinges. So if you have such a column or a pier, if you push this structure, the connection just assume that there is a, a fixed connection in the top and bottom. The top is kind of kind of fixed. It's maybe not 100% fixed, but we can assume it as a fixed. There are two main two parts right here and right here in the top that um, there is a possibility of the formation of the plastic hinges. Okay, so. Um, that means that the structure is going to fail through those points. All right. So what we can do, we can find out the uh, plastic hinge or um, plastic hinge property, which is a, um, a function of the material that I use. For example, the concrete that you use there, and then the rebars that you use there. So combination of those guys would be uh, leading to finding out those plastic hinge behavior. And that's pretty important because the failure of this structure probably would be, uh, you know, considered by when the first plastic hinges forms there. So it's going to be the, uh, the ultimate or going to be the uh, failure of that structure. All right. You can find out the, uh, for example, if you are using software like the Civil, you can simply define, uh, generate those moment curvature, which we're going to talk about that as a uh, next slide and then assign it to different part of the column. So it depends how the connection of the column uh, might be. So you may have different parts for the uh, plastic form, but more than 90% of the time we're just applying the 
plastic form uh, plastic hinges to the uh, bottom of the column because that's the highly possibility for the formation of the plastics from the you know just simple structural analysis. All right, but how to find out those things? I mentioned that um, that plastic hinges or plastic behavior of the column is uh, based on the type of material that we use. For example, assume that this is your column. All right, it's a circular column. I have some reinforcement inside that, and I use certain uh, you know grade of the concrete. Just say grade uh, five thousand. All right. So based on those, we can generate the. Uh, we can find out what is the uh, plastic behavior of that column. All right. One uh, well-known method is to find out the moment curvature. So the moment curvature uh, for define, uh, for finding out the moment curvature of a uh, certain section, what we need we need to define nonlinear material first. So how to define those nonlinear material in this this column, like a reinforced concrete column? I have my concrete. Uh, which has two parts actually. You see the pink part right here, which is the confined concrete. This is confined because we had the confinement uh, spiral or ties around them. So it's a kind of concrete inside that has, um, you know, showing us the better uh, behavior or better response. So you can see from this diagram right here, which is the Mander model. This is one of the model, I mean, the concrete model that uh, most of the, uh, you know, seismic codes in the U.S. are recommending. For example, um, Ashto uh, SDC is recommending that one, and Caltrans also recommending that one. Other states also um, using this Mander model. So this is pretty sophisticated model. And as you can see, there are two models in the Mander model. One is for the uh, unconfined. As, as you can see, this is the force versus, uh, I mean, stress versus strain. Or you can say that force versus displacement, but stress strain would be better. And now here we see that this one, the unconfined, doesn't have that much of good, good performance, while if you have a confined concrete, the same material with the same grade, with the same compressive strength of concrete, you see that it's going to show you better performance, and it's going to absorb more energy, and it can have like better, I mean, nicer performance. This is why we are separating the concrete to the confined, inside the, um, I mean, the core concrete will be confined, and then the cover concrete will be unconfined. So this is pretty well-known method. I'm just explaining them for uh, people who are new to this method. And then for the rebar, most of the codes, um, like Ashto and Caltrans and all, all other states that have the seismic um, design criteria, um, they allow us to use the bilinear curve for the steel, like using the Plastic, perfectly plastic. So we don't consider this uh, strain hardening part. But if you are using uh, software like Mida Civil, there you are able to not only you can uh, define the bilinear curves like a elastic, perfectly plastic curves, but also you can model the. Uh, I mean, using this park model, which uh, giving you the realistic behavior of the uh, steel, and as you can see. It, uh, it it's using the strain hardening part, and it's gonna go all the way to the ultimate uh, capacity of the steel. So this is pretty helpful. Uh, anyway, so you need to define these first. These are the uh, requirements for being able to generate the moment curvature. And then what you do, just run the. I mean, using any software, you can you can also use the hand calculation, but it takes time probably. And uh, you know, we can generate such a behavior. So it's going to be the behavior of the this column, under uh, which we are on the y-axis, we have the moment, and under the x-axis, we have the curvature. So curvature will be uh, easily calculated based on the shape of the deformation of the column, technically. But what you probably need to use at the end of the day for defining the uh, plastic hinges right here, to define this plastic hinge, would be just uh, considering this uh, bilinear curve, the blue line that you see here, uh, which we call it idealized curve. So this idealized curve would be good enough, and then uh, software understands, I mean, whatever software that you're going to use, it's going to understand that until this point, this point of the moment, uh, which is on the structure, on the column, it's going to go linearly upward, and then from that point, it's going to be a plateau, or kind of is yielded, you can say that. Okay. 
So there are way more options that we can talk about the uh, moment curvature, how to generate those, how to improve them, and blah, blah. So, but uh, that's the uh, limitation for the time. We can talk about more, uh, talk about those guys more than this. Now we're going to go to the next part, which will be the foundation. In this foundation, as we uh, discussed in earlier, it, we're going to talk about the modeling the abutment or the soil springs uh, behind the abutment as well as the foundation itself, uh, I mean the piles and pile groups. That's pretty important to model the uh, abutment itself, as you can see is modeled right here. And more importantly, it's important to model the soil behind the abutment because that's going to give us more realistic response of the structure. Just consider that if you if you uh, simulate or model the entire the structure with the simplified method, for example, simplified method, I mean uh, in the abutment, you just ignore the abutment and just apply the simply support there or you're like a fixed support there. So definitely you are coming up with some sort of the, uh, you know, assumption and that's not leading to a uh, economic design because you are just uh, doing the analysis on some uh, other type of a structure. So if you want to see like real behavior and then make it like a more realistic, that's the way that we're going to do that. We're going to model the entire um, I mean part of the structure and also we can simulate the soil behind that. And then for simulating the soil behind the abutment, there are a couple of methods. For example, um, the, the initial one would be just to get the results from the uh, in situ tests, like a geotechnical engineer, they can do the test for you and then tell you that this is the uh, springs for the uh, structural engineer and then structural engineer can apply the springs in a different direction that uh, you know is provided at different point of the abutment. But there are some simplified methods also. Uh, for example, you see this uh, uh, method based on the different parameter of the soil, you can simply calculate this uh, springs. As you can see, this behavior, this curve is giving us the uh, nonlinear behavior of the uh, soil behind us because we have to kind of assume, I mean not assume, we have to understand that the soil uh, has like a nonlinear behavior when it's interacting with the structure and depends on the forces, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't deform linearly. Or um, there's a, a simpler method. This is a um, kind of older method. It's a classic method being used um, with a lot of engineers. But uh, there are also simplified methods, more, um, um, you know, practical. This method is uh, generated by, I mean, developed by uh, Castrans, I believe. And then they, um, they have like a, just this simple equation. With this simple equation, you have two parameters, C and D, which need to be calculated by these two simple equations. And all these values that you see here, K, Y, F, R, these are all the soil parameters. Easily you can generate those, easily you can find them, and then, uh, you know, just fill up this uh, equation, find the C and D value, then you're going to, based on that, you're going to come up with such a curve. This is so easy. And, for example, Y maximum for the sandy soil is going to be the 0 0.5. Uh, 0.5 h, which h will be the, uh, the depth of the uh, depth of the uh, uh, abutment, or the I mean the height of the abutment, or the depth of the soil that you have. And there are different options for the uh, cohesive soil. So these are will be kind of uh, constant, depends on the height. And then you're going to calculate this k uh, 50 based on the slope of this line. Easily, you can just go ahead and uh, get your uh, curve defined. All right, and then if you are using the software like Midas Civil, uh, you can simply define such a curve inside the Midas, and then you, say, you see that uh, that the springs behind the abutment have exactly showing you exactly the same deformation as you are applying the forces. Even these equations are become simpler to become like more practical, and then you know less complexity, just very simple and straightforward. So this is the equation um, um, I got it from the uh, uh, Catrans, uh, and I believe we have the same thing in the Ashtar as well, and then based on for the sand and clay, as you can see, uh, we have the like constant uh, values, and then we can simply use these to calculate the uh, abutment source, uh, springs. Now let's talk about the 
foundation. So this part might be more interesting because selecting a different method can affect the uh, time of analysis and can affect the uh, you know total response of the structure more than what the abutment does. Just assume that you have such a long bridge and then uh, you have many uh, peer caps and under each one you have the you know a group of piles. So all these are the pile cap and then the piles are underneath those. So the question is how should I model this one? There are two main methods. One is the direct method that you saw it here which means I'm modeling entire structure, superstructure, substructure and foundation all together. And the second method is substructure method, which means I am uh, not modeling all these uh, um, piles because there is some advantage on there. I'm going to talk about them, and then replacing entire the pile group, like entire this one, with only one spring, which carries. I mean, that spring should carry the uh, behavior of the entire the pile group. Okay, by that one I mean. Uh, for example, if you have uh, one keeps foot, uh, one keeps uh, force applying on the structure and has, for example, this much or let's say one inch of this deformation on the uh, on the, um, the this part of the uh, sub substructure, you have to have exactly the same. I mean, uh, you have to have exactly the same uh, matrix on the six by six matrices to show you the exactly the same amount of displacement. So it's a kind of like uh, challenging to ca to calculate those six by six matrices, which is a good representation or is a good substitute for the uh, entire the pi group. There are different methods to calculate those as well. But what is the advantages of using this one, and what's the disadvantage of using the other one? So uh, each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. And uh, in a different situation, you may consider to using any of those. That completely depends on the need of the project whatever you want to accomplish and uh, what you want to design. That's completely based on the uh, project and then definitely the time that you need to uh, consider for the drawing the analysis. For example, let's talk about the direct method. So the direct method is going to give you a very accurate result because what we're doing here, we are modeling entire the superstructure, substructure, and foundations and all the piles um, all together, so we're gonna see the interaction of interaction between the superstructure and substructure, and then the foundation. So that's pretty, uh, you know, giving us a very good result in this way. And then the response of the structure would be um, very accurate and very close to the uh, real response of the structure in the field. Okay, but there are a couple of things that uh, we should do. For example, assume that you have 50 of these uh, micro piles here, and then you have to simulate the, uh, and each pile, let's say, have uh, 20 feet, 30 feet, or 50 feet deep. And then you, those are experiencing different layers of the soil, so definitely you need to apply different springs at each point. So because they, they don't have the same spring, uh, uh, I mean, response. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you that how we are uh, utilizing the PY curves to calculate those things. But I'll just explain this to tell you that how heavy going to be the model if you use such a model, okay? So probably the analysis that we're going to run on this one, it takes a long time, but it's going to give you correct results. On the other hand, if you um, don't have enough time to run the, like a full analysis, uh, a full model, run the analysis on full, entire the model, so you better use the sub, uh, substructure method, which means you just ignoring these, uh, I mean, not ignoring, you just deleting entire the piles and then replace them with one matrix, uh, one spring, which has the mass, damping, and stiffness matrices at six by six, which is, um, I mean, those six are six degrees of freedom, uh, which you can not model. Okay, let's talk about the direct method. I'm going to just uh, uh, explain that more. Here I have a, uh, zooming the one part of the, uh, you know, my pilot system. And as you can see, I can simulate the, I can simulate the uh, springs and the damping of the uh, soil at that location. That's what I modeled here. And then applying the different stiffnesses to different locations of the pile. 
the question is how you gonna find out those springs in a different depth of the pile. Answer is you can get those results from the geotechnical people. So geotechnical engineer just uh, run the pushover and all, uh, like a uh, pushing the structure. I can call the pushover also there, and then they they getting a, some uh, py curves in the lateral directions. All right, and then based on those, based on the different depth of the soil, as you can see here, uh, pile has different deformation, and uh, definitely based on the different layer of the ground, and then you know the force that they're experiencing, you may have different uh, you know stiffness. Uh, for example, here in this curve, P, P versus Y, which is the load versus displacement, I can uh, find out this uh, slope of this, I mean linear slope of this uh, uh, soil as a spring as like when I'm connecting this point to that point. And as you can see, as I'm going deeper, it's going to be steeper and then, you know, probably have like a uh, uh, larger um, uh, steepness. The same story goes on for the vertical or the frictional uh, stiffness, uh, which we have to do the TZ curve. So the TZ curve, in this case, we are pushing the, uh, applying the force laterally to the structure to find out the PY curve. But for the TZ curve, we are applying the uh, forces in the vertical direction and then again finding the uh, uh, respond of the structure. As you can see here, uh, we got these uh, TZ curves for the different depths. And as you can see, this one also getting steeper as we're going um, deeper in the pipe. All right. One more thing. Uh, so far, we talked about the simulating the springs. Okay. But that's very important. You have to consider that uh, that springs is uh, just representing the nonlinear behavior of the soil and the structure. Okay. But depends on the depth of the pile and then the location of the piles. Those nodes or do that part of the uh, pile may also experience different forcing function. As you can see here, I have this forcing function applies on this location, I have this forcing function applies on different location, and different one in different location. So that's pretty important to be more accurate and then uh, consider different forcing function if you have like a, um, you know, pretty long bridge where the site is changing, the soil layers are changing, or if you have like a deep Okay. Um, there are simple equations for uh, you know curves and equations and all those uh, simplified methods for uh, calculating the um, that stiffness or you know py curves. Here I have one simple example. This is a risk model for the sand. Um, so uh, you can see that how the curves for different depths. These are the different depths along the um, depth of pile and how to calculate these values based on the, uh, you know, total width of the pile, and then how to use these curves. Here I have some simple, typical K values uh, um, for these, you know, sands, so you can just simply use any of those. But to be more accurate, we definitely need to define those options. Now, after you calculated this one, how to apply these on the structure? I have some example which you can, uh, you know, there are, uh, some consistent models which widely used by the engineers. Let me just uh, explain a couple of those. The first one is the uh, kinematic hardening. So what you see here is kind of showing you, uh, you know, the behavior of the soil by this model. Here I have on the y-axis I have a p-value, which is a force, and the x-axis I have a displacement. So you can see that this hysteresis loop um, going up here then loading is going to be nonlinear, has a different uh, slope, and then when you have an unloading, you're going to see the plastic deformation in this area, and then uh, again changes the slope, plastic deformation goes on. So you can see that by increasing the loads, this loop is going on and on, and then you see also the plastic deformation of the, of the, uh, you know, the soil. So that's pretty important. Kinematic hardening uh, model is uh, mostly used for non-gapping behavior. So just assume that this way. If you have like a pile, okay, and the pile is uh, surrounded by the, by the soil, which means if you push the pile in any direction, so you're going to see the, uh, the soil around it going to resist that, that uh, deformation. So we're going to see that uh, kind of that the springs or that uh, non-linear behavior is already there for both directions. 
even you push it from the left to right or right to left. But if you have like one wall, just a retaining wall, uh, in one side we have only the soil, right? So we're going to see that the springs uh, behind the wall only from one side. So that's the difference between like a gapping and non-gapping behavior. Right? So when you see that a non-gapping behavior, I'm talking about the compression and tension, which would be, uh, you know, one example would be the pile, where it's surrounded by the soil from the all directions. Well, we have the Takeda model, uh, which normally used for the modeling a non-gapping, uh, sorry, gapping behavior, or uh, talking about just the compression only, just an example of that retaining wall, just assume that if you push the structure, push the wall, so you're going to see that it's uh, soil going to uh, resist it, uh, but if you're going to pull it or just, you know, pull the wall, there's no resistance but the, you know, strength of the wall itself. Right? You, you can see the uh, different behavior also here, the, just following these uh, curves, you're going to see that this is a trilinear curve, one line here, then you're going to have the first a yielding at this point going up, then it's going to be the second yielding, and then we're going to have a non, uh, uh, sorry, the unloading and on. There are different methods also, like a pivot model. So they have also different parameters. You're going to define them, and the software going to follow those curves. But um, to be more accurate, uh, we are, um, you know, providing a more accurate uh, type of inputs for the users in Midas Civil where you can just apply the uh, force versus displacement which you are getting from the uh, PY curve directly here into Midas and you can just copy paste the data from the Excel to here to simulate the exact behavior of the uh, spring. That could be uh, only the compression or only tension or it could be goes both directions. So you're going to see when it goes like this way you're going to see the plastic deformation of the sword when you have an unloading. It's going to come back with the first slope of the, uh, you know, that curve. All right? So this is pretty uh, impressive and useful when you want to model a more accurate uh, type of uh, nonlinearity. But for, uh, you know, simple structures, you can, all, you can use any of these functions, and they're going to give us you pretty... Uh, pretty good uh, result. All these methods, all these uh, constitutive models are also available in my discipline. Alright, so let's uh, talk about the uh, second method, which is the substructure method. So in the substructure method, we say that we have to look for um, one substitution for the pile system. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete the pile system and then place only one spring. That spring should have the 6 by 6 matrices of the mass damping and stiffness. Okay, those are the three main uh, parameters in the uh, dynamic analysis, right? So if you check the classic equation of the dynamic equation, we're going to see mass versus the, uh, you know, uh, acceleration, and then we're going to see the damping versus the velocity, and we're going to see the displacement versus the, uh, uh, the, 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 the forces, okay? So uh, how to do that, how to find out these uh, parameters. So all these, uh, you know, members of the matrix for the stiffness and the mass would be simply calculated. For the mass, you can simply calculate them that how much of the mass going to be uh, uh, contributing for different uh, direction. As you can see here, we have the K11, which is for the dx, dy, dz, and then rotational degrees of freedom. So that's uh, pretty Simple. There are methods of this. There are like uh, some simplified method. Um, I know that a couple of DOTs, like uh, I believe the Caltrans is providing this one. Washington DOT. I saw some uh, paper on them that they're providing some solution how to um, calculate those things. So you can search for them. And after uh, calculating these uh, matrices, like a stiffness and the mass, then you can simply uh, use this, uh, use such an equation which is the Rayleigh method and then you, in this method you need to fi uh, find out the alpha and beta value and then based on those you can simply calculate the, I mean, add these matrices with those coefficients and it's going to give us the, uh, technically the uh, damping matrices. All right. 
So uh, I covered the first two parts, uh, which was uh, talking about the nonlinearity part. Now uh, let's talk a little bit about the forcing functions. So if you remember, in the beginning of the presentation, we talked about the uh, the way that the earthquake is recorded by those um, accelerograms. So how uh, what we're getting with, with the acceleration and uh, probably velocity, and most of the time. We are just uh, normalizing the acceleration, and that's the ac normalized acceleration is uh, widely used for the running the time history analysis. But now, assume that we have such a uh, site, as you can see, there are different layers of the soil, and then the rock, and then, you know, different uh, parts. And each of those definitely based on the, um, you know, property of those soil layers, the earthquake which is coming here will be definitely, um, you know, those waves will be different when they are reaching to the ground or reaching where they, uh, you know, my pile going to be located, all right? So definitely each pile going to experience different uh, forcing. Now, how to generate those, um, you know, displacement time stories? When you have the acceleration of time history, so you can, the first method would be using a, it's going to be the direct integration. Because based on the uh, classic methods, we have the, we take the first derivative of the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, first integration of the acceleration going to give us the velocity. And then if we take another, um, you know, integral from this one, it's going to give us the displacement. So definitely there are some, you know, additional, uh, um, the numbers gonna be here, so we can just go through all those and then find out those uh, variables. But this is just simply I'm just showing you what equation gonna be. So taking the direct integration and then come up with such a displacement forcing function. So you see that the, with the same time history, uh, with the same time, if this is my acceleration, this gonna be the response of the, I mean the displacement of the ground at that certain location. Another method is to use the Fourier series. So you can simply have the um, acceleration uh, from the accelerogram and then using the uh, reverse Fourier uh, the transport, uh, transformed and then uh, calculate the displacement time history. And then simply you can use this uh, for your um, you know, analysis. I have one example for you uh, showing you that if you have such a long bridge, how to simulate the uh, you know, here you see the nonlinear behavior of the uh, bearing, so definitely the displacement are exaggerated. Just uh, hopefully you can see that the formations. It might be a little slow through the internet, but uh, that'll be nice if you can see these options. So here we see the um, nonlinear behavior of the, um, you know, the bearings as well as right here, you see that the nonlinear behavior of the uh, columns as well. So we can simply follow, if you use Midas Civil, I took this uh, video from the Midas Civil. If you use Midas Civil, you can see exactly uh, when you're applying the uh, plastic hinges to the column, you can exactly follow the, um, the columns and you see that in the different, different level of the forcing, uh, if any of those columns or any, any of those, uh, you know, uh, plastic hinges are formed, and then you have the failure of the structure. So that's pretty um, useful in this way. All right, um, that's it uh, about the uh, presentation today. Um, now, if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer to those questions. Um, they asked if uh, where they can uh, find out the copy of the software, uh, sorry, the presentation. We're going to have it on our website, uh, and then we're going to share it with everyone um, after the presentation.
Um, the asked if we can um, assume a point of the fixity for the uh, pile uh, with the displacement of the zero inches and then ignore the uh, ignore the springs. Um, um, I didn't quite understand the question, but let me just show you what we have here. For example, here um, you see there is a change in the when we have like a pile and then we are pushing it in the laterally. So we see that there is a change in the, for example, here is uh, where the uh, you know curvature is changing and we can call it like a point of infl inflection. So probably we have the zero moment at this location. All right. So probably you can just fix the uh, structure from that point, or you can find out where with the displacement zero, and then you can fix it at that point and ignore the whatever is below that. But that's not. I don't recommend that because. Uh, we have the active uh, behavior of the soil and also passive forces um, because when you simulating this pile or if you have like a retaining wall or whatever embedded uh, structure in the soil, we're going to see the, uh, you know, when you're pushing it even the, from left to right, we're going to see some forces from here and then we're going to see also some forces right here in the uh, left side. So that's pretty important. You have to consider those to come up with for example, even if you want to follow the simplified methods uh, of Bishop and all those, those also require to have those forces. Um, I don't recommend it to ignore that, but again, it is completely depends on the case. And uh, you know, sometimes we may, if we ignore that, we are not seeing that much of changes in the response of the structure. So, yeah, if it's the case, definitely just ignore that because it definitely going to reduce the size of analysis and definitely going to save your time and save your save your money. Uh, they're asking about the um, soil spring, I mean considering the damping in the soil springs. You can consider the damping in the soil springs, yes. The damping uh, will be considered as a linear damping. So, uh, yeah, we can consider that one. Uh, but what's the value for that depends again on the uh, soil. But I believe like a 5% uh, or uh, less will be considered here. Uh, they ask what happens to the uh, software if the shaking the structure causes the column to fail. Um, so that depends what type of analysis you are running. If you are running a um, non -linear, um, let's say pushover analysis, so we can just uh, ask the software to uh, having, for example, the uh, displacement control or force control, or you can just tell the software if the um, Mm, you know, the mm, hinges is reaching the second yield, just to stop them and terminate the analysis. You can do that, or if you want to just consider that one, you can just, uh, I mean, ignore that one, you can just go uh, to the end of the uh, analysis. But there is a way to terminate the analysis, and the software stops at the uh, point of failure. So you can definitely understand what is the point of failure in MITACIP. Thank you.
Um, yes, they asked, the, we didn't show how to apply these uh, cases and I mean, they define this nonlinearity in Midas Civil. That's completely correct because this presentation uh, was the general information about the displacement time history. Uh, we're going to have the training sessions. If you guys are interested, we're going to provide the, uh, you know, uh, more training sessions for the showing you exactly how to um, uh, apply this, how to simulate this nonlinearity for soil springs, for plastic hinges, how to generate the uh, moment curvature, how to you know uh, apply the displacement time history, how to define different forcing functions. All of them will be provided in the next session. But today uh, it was just about the general presentation and general information about this type of analysis. Um, yes, they asked if the uh, soil damping can be provided in the term of an um, attached dash pot. Yes, that's correct. In Midas Serial, we have the uh, springs, which is linear and nonlinear. We have dash pot. Dash pots are just linear. And then we have different type of base isolator, different type of bearings. Yeah, those are completely um, doable in Midas. You can um, define them. 